prophets. I have just been reading the prophets, and the more I am in the prophets, the more I know that their message is for us today. Amen? The message of the prophets are for us. You did not say amen. But I know that I, I know that you meant to say amen, but you just forgot to say it. So it's okay. I forgive you. I forgive you. Okay. So uh, uh, Micah here, what lessons can we learn from him? Well, first thing we can start with is with his name. Micah is also will give the tone or the theme of the book. Micah is Mika Yahu, that is uh, who is like God, and that is becoming the theme of. Of, of his message, who is like God, or who is like Jehovah. And the first slide will give us one of the verse that he, he relates to that, Micah 7, 18, who is a God like you? And we will come back to that later, but it's really, keep that in mind as we go through the, the message today. This is the theme of that book. Each prophet have a lot of similarities. Condemnations of sin, exaltation of the glory and the authority and sovereignty of God, and, and a call to repent, and if you repent, the judgment will not come. So there's a lot of similarities in their message. But each prophet also bring forth a, a, a particularities. This belongs to them. This is their team. This is what's burning on their heart that, that makes them uh, stand, stand out a little bit. Uh, Micah is a minor prophet. So what does that mean? Does that mean that his message is not as important? Of course not. That's not what it means. It means that his book is shorter. In fact, one of the title of the book of Micah has been called Isaiah in Miniature, like a mini Isaiah uh, book. Remember, like uh, the book of Isaiah is a very, very long book, uh, 60 some chapters, but this one is uh, only seven chapters. But a lot of similarities in between the message of Isaiah and him. Uh, Micah is also a contemporary of uh, Amos, Hosea, and, and uh, Isaiah, and he came a little bit uh, later. So let's go to the, the theme of, of, this, of this book. The theme of this book, uh, the next slide you will see uh, the, the theme, yeah, this one. The book is separated in uh, three parts. And the first three chapters talks about the failure of the nation. Uh, a lot of condemnations, and we will come back to that in a moment. And this is the same theme that many of the prophets uh, bring forth. But in this book, we have one theme comes out of this, is that the failure to be like God, not being like God, Godlessness in these three first chapters. The second part, four and five, is a vision of the future. It's a messianic announcement. The one who is like God, the Messiah, is coming, and his mission will be to make you and I like God. This is, this is his mission. This is the one who is coming. And the third part, uh, chapter 6 and 7, it is God pleading with the nation of Israel, like uh, having conversation with them, and also telling us how to be God-like uh, in our lives. So that's basically a simple summary of the book. The main uh, target of rebuke in this book is to the civil and religious leaders of, of Israel who were mostly responsible for leading the people into sin. And we see that in the next verse. You can read the first opening verse. Listen, you leaders of Israel. So that's really the target because they are the ones who are supposed to be the representative of God, uh, either religiously or civil. They know the word of God. They offer sacrifice as we will see uh, later. So let's, let's read this qu quickly. You're supposed to know right from wrong. You are the very ones who hate good and love evil. You skin or you oppress or abuse my people alive. Then you beg the Lord for help in times of trouble. Do you really expect him to answer? After all the evil you have done, he won't even look at you. The verse 5. This is what the Lord says. You false prophets are leading my people astray. And then you will recognize something very modern uh, and our generation, the TV evangelist, and this and this verse here. You false prophets are leading my people astray. You promise peace for those who give you food or will send their money. Okay? Uh, if you send me $1,000, I'm going to pray for you and uh, you will receive tons and tons of blessing. And then 
uh, you declare war on those who refuse to feed you. You don't send me your money. No, no, no. You will be kept away from the blessing of God. So you see so many things that address our modern society and this. If you look at 11, the first part of the verse, uh, cities, rulers, governs for bribes, the priests for, for pay, and the prophets for money. And this is in every sphere of the society. Micah, as a prophet, as, as sent by God, has been seeking godliness or godlikeness in this society among the, the rulers of the nation. Because these rulers are the representative of God. They have been appointed for God to lead God's people to God. But instead of finding uh, what he's looking for, God-likeness, he has found idolatry, evil business practices, oppressions, bribes, uh, all of these things, dishonesty, corruptions. And God was not going to allow his people to lead. I mean, this, these leaders to lead uh, his people away. He's not going to allow these sinful practices to continue. So the message becomes punishment with famine, war, and ultimately uh, deportations. And then there's something st funny and, uh, and how people can easily deceive themselves and we will come and apply it into our lives. If you go to the next one, 11b, and after reading all the awful things that they are doing, they, they have the nerve to claim that the Lord is with them. No harm will come to us, they say. The Lord is with us. Religion becomes like uh, self-protection, like a symbol of safety. Uh, we are God's people. We are the descendants of Abraham. Uh, so nothing can touch us. We are stronger than the other nation. God will protect us. But God just is speaking to them. And we have read, uh, we have seen in the previous sermons how God says, says, over and over and over, he has sent prophets with the same message, condemning the same sins. And the sins that are being condemned in the times of the prophets are the same sinfulness condemned in our own generation. We see bribes and uh, teaching for pay, and we see all of these things happening in our generation. The message of the prophets is not different from the message of the New Testament. Why? Because God hasn't changed. The problem of man hasn't changed. The problem of man is still sinfulness. W walking away in independence from God. So the message has never changed. You know, don't think, many Christians, I think we have something stored in our mind. The Old Testament is not really, really for me. It's the Old Testament. It's the law. You know, and we will come back to that point later. So me, I'm in the New Testament. I like the New Testament. It's, it's you know, it's easier, you know, and everything. The message of the Old Testament is the foundation of the message of the New Testament. The message of the Old Testament is the same message explained through the things that we found in the New, in the New Testament that is a bit different is that the Messiah has come. And there's a lot of theology explaining to us the results, the impact, what he has done. But basically, the message of God is the same in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. I hope that you become convinced of that through the previous message and, and even more, more today. So they have the nerve to see that because God is in their midst, no harm will come to them. And God, in fact, is greatly displeased when his people profess their faith, their allegiance to God, but in fact only have an outward or superficial devotion. And I think that if we examine ourselves, sometimes we go in that direction. And we have some similarities with these people. Uh, we will come back to that in a moment. After that, you will see uh, some conversation that God has. He's confronting, but he's asking questions. He's, he's trying to get the people to understand where he's coming from. And the next one, God is talking to them and asking questions. Chapter 6, verse 3. My people... What have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. Why do you reject me, in other words? Why did you turn me aside? What did I do to deserve that? And then God will explain to them, look back how I, I delivered you from Egypt. You remember, then he will say, remember when Balak 
wanted to uh, call Balaam to bring curses on you, I sent you blessing and said, and so God is talking, I have protected you, I have blessed you, I have delivered you, I have led you. Wh wh what do you have against me? What did I do wrong to you? And which way have I offended you? So that's what God is asking. So uh, with, with such an argument, you would think that the people would say, oh, sorry, God, uh, we, we really mis misunderstood you. Uh, uh, yeah, we're okay now. We're ready to, to repent and we're ready to change. Is that what the message is going, the, the response is? If you look at the next part, the people are responding to God. How am I to present myself in the Lord's presence and bow in the presence of the high God? Should I present myself with burnt offerings, with year old calves? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with endless rivers of oil, or even sacrificing my own, my own child? So people, instead of coming into realizing that their relationship to God was fake, their sense of security was not real, because they were based on external rituals instead of a heart that God is after, instead of coming to repentance and realization, the seriousness of the problem, they just says, God, what can I give you and so that you will leave me alone? That, that's basically what, what it means. So that I can go on with my life, my false sense of security, my safety, I'm okay. And, and uh, a thought came to me uh, about how sometimes we fool ourselves. In our church, for instance, we may even think, you know, look at myself. I have much, much more good than bad, isn't it? I may be 80, 85, 90% good, okay? I only have maybe 10 or 5 or 25% bad. I'm okay. I'm much better than brother Sebastian, he's 50 person, <laughs> but me, I'm 80 person good. Or oh, brother Keith is like uh, only 35 person, <laughs> he's really, really bad. <laughs> he says, you, you, you see, it's, I, I'm, I'm telling the truth, he just points his finger to me, he says, I'm going to get you for this, you see. <laughs> Sometimes we have these uh, comparison systems. Uh, I'm okay, I'm good enough with God. I go to Lighthouse, this is a good church, I love the songs, I even involve in some forms of service. Sometimes I sing a special songs with the choir. I do a lot of uh, things that are right. And I'm not that bad, I'm not a killer, I'm not like, uh, I, I don't sleep over with other people or something, you know, that if I'm not married with, and you know, this kind of thinking. But is that enough? Is it enough? Is that what God is looking for? So that's how people want to be. So God, what, what, what kind of religious service can I do to, so that you will not look at me, you will look the other way and I will have the impressions that I'm good enough, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay. Are you okay? <laughs> you don't know what to answer, eh? <laughs> it's right, it's right. Let me feel that I'm okay because I'm more good than I am bad. And God answered to them, no. He says no to that. No, O oh people. The Lord has told you what is good and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy and walk humbly before your God. The answer of God is, this is the way to God-likeness. You want to be like God? Then be like God. This is the way to be like God. It's not through superficial sacrifice. Okay, I give an offering to the projects to Sichuan. Uh, I do some activities in the church. Uh, no, that's not, God says, no people, this is not what I require of you. What I require of you is your life, is your inside, it's your true devotions, it's your relationship with me. This is what I care for. This is what I'm looking for. Let me apply it to, to our church for a while. We are church goers and we should apply this principle to, to our lives. Don't we have in our midst here, right now, Christians who worship with an unrighteousness in their hearts? With unrighteousness that maybe have been there for years, 
and are still there. This root of unrighteousness or bitterness or grudge or, or dishonesty or not telling the truth, hiding something, living two lives, has been there, is there, and will continue to be there. And still, because I come to church on Sunday and I am in a godly atmosphere with other godly people, that gives me the impression that I'm okay with God. Hello? Are you still there? Okay. So maybe we have Christians who worship with unrighteousness in their heart. Maybe they have treated others unfairly. Have you ever treated someone unfairly? Yes. Uh, have, we, have you excluded certain person from your exclusive special circle of friends? These are my friends. You are not my friend. Have you not acted or spoken in love or with love or out of love, but instead have used hurtful words, unwholesome words, against somebody that has been hurt because of that. Have you done that? Maybe. Yes? Well, you are quiet now. Okay. <laughs> then, we still come to worship. We practice these things. These problems have been part of us. They have not been dealt with but we are still coming to worship. Isn't it Christmas now? Season? Yes? yes. We sing, Oh, come let us adore. Come let us adore Him. We adore you. We adore you. We offer sacrifices of praise. God says, No. No, that's not what I want. I don't want your talents of singing. I don't want you singing the right words. I want your heart. I want more than a sacrifice. I want more than religion. I want more than a performance. I want more that during the week you go in your office and you go and do your work and you are angry and you speak bad words and you criticize one and you judge another one, you lie to your employer, you cheat here or there, or even worse, the things. I, I don't even want to know everything that is there. But God knows. God knows and he says, you come celebrate Christmas. You come celebrate Christmas and sing all the right songs and the songs of worship. And God says, the same message he spoke in Micah's time is applicable to us today. Do you think God is pleased or displeased if we come to worship and we have these unrighteous living inside of us? Sex, adultery, fornications, backmouthing, destroying someone's reputation, not paying our debts, or something like this, and just ignoring that. Just, God, what, what can I offer to you that I will not think about this, I will not be disturbed by this, and I will still have the, the false sense that I'm okay after all. I'm more better than I'm worse. And that should be good enough for me. God says, no. That is not. You have to walk humbly before God. What does that mean? And then, you know, Jesus said, this is the New Testament, and this is Jesus, says, okay, this is Sunday morning. Brother Bona is coming to Lighthouse. And then God says, he remembers that he has something in his heart against somebody, or that somebody has something against him. He says, but he is coming to worship. So he's coming for a good reason. He's coming to sing, going to worship, going to lift his spirit up. God says, whoa, stop, go back, settle your problem, come and worship. Who said these words? Hello? Jesus. So should we take it seriously? That's what Jesus says. He says, if you come to worship, come to worship with a pure heart. Otherwise, you're worshiping nothing. 
You're doing absolutely nothing. You, you, you're deceiving yourself into a false sense of security. That's the message of the prophet. Is that good for us? Is it possible that we, we, we need to hear that? Thank you for those who said yes. How many are ignoring? We are ignoring that and we come to worship God nevertheless. In spite that Jesus says, don't come like that. It's not going to work. Is there something in your life, relationship, words, treatments of others that God dislike? If there are, settle that and come to worship. Otherwise, it's bad. It's bad for you because your problem will go increasing. It's not going to make you feel better. It's going to harden your heart, mislead you, deceive you to become a worse person. The theme of this book is becoming godlike. But when I go on living, go on practicing religion without my heart being changed, without living according to the word, that the Lord says, I told you what is good. I told you what I require of you. And then I go on ignoring that and practicing religion. That's not pleasing to God. It's, it's not producing God-likeness. It's hardening us into becoming further and further with God. And it's becoming more dangerous. And it is uh, calling for the judgment of God or the correction of God or the discipline of God or something instead of the pure blessing and the joy of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Sorry that uh, this is a Christmas message, huh? We're supposed to be a message of love and message of joy. So I hope that you still can keep that in your heart. Israel responded to God's requirement, just trying to appease God with sacrifice. What sacrifice? Tons and rivers of oil and all these kind of things. But God, that's not what he wants. God wants change lives. He wants God, uh, lives that are being changed to become uh, like Him. Amen? Amen. If you, uh, Andreas, would you go back to the first slide and the parts, showing you the part from, yeah, this verse. This is the New Testament. What does God want? This is only an Ephesian, and there's only a few, few, few uh, scriptures. Until we attain the fullness of Christ. Put the new self created to be like God in holiness and righteousness. D is, is it taking place in our lives? Is that what is happening? We're coming to celebrate Christmas. We're coming to adore Him. Are we going to adore Him? Therefore, be imitators of God and live a life of love just as Christ. Do we have the opposite of love? store in some corners of our heart for certain people, impurity, something less than holiness, something less than righteousness, do we have that? And we are still ignoring that, putting it away from our minds, just not thinking about it. That's a good way to, to live your Christian life. Just not think about it so that it will not bother you. That's the sin that they were doing in the time of Micah. Let God, what, what, what kind of religious things can we do that will help us to ignore the real problem of my life and not to deal with that and just go on living my life? That's the message of Isaiah. He wants us to become God-like. And the condemnations of the message is like, you are not becoming God-like. You are Godless like. And then it's not going to work, even if we have a form of religion. This is even a sign of the last days, and, uh, and Timothy, isn't it? And the last days, people will have the appearance of godliness, but not what gives the strength of that uh, godliness. And this is just the New Testament and the Old Testament says the same thing. Yes? Okay, this side is more convinced than that side, and this side is not convinced at all. <laughs> okay, let's go to Micah chapter 7, verse 18. Then God had to wake them up and bring a disc disc description of judgment 
until we come to chapter 7. And then in chapter 7, the prophet will conclude his message with the most marvelous picture of God. Who is a God like you? Who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession. He does not retain his anger forever. Because he delights in unchanging love, he will again have compassion on us. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. If you look at this text, but don't really go deep, you will think that sinfulness is not really a problem. Because it says, he passes over rebellious acts. So you're okay. Even though you don't deal with your sin, God pardons. You know, there's a lot of abuse of twisted scriptures. You look at the scriptures like that, means, okay, God is pretty cool. He pardons iniquity. Okay, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. And he passed over rebellious acts. So okay, if I'm not perfect, I'm okay with that. Uh, he, he's, he's not really easily getting angry, so I'm okay. I can go on, okay? And then uh, he has compassion, so he understand. He understand. We're all the same. We nobody is perfect and all this. Did you all, uh, ever think like this? We hear messages that preach this, but if you look carefully at this text, who is a God like you who pardons iniquity? Is he tolerating iniquity? Is that what it means? Is he turning a bl blind eye to iniquity? Is that what it means when he says he passed over the rebellious act? No, this is a prophetic announcement of the one, of the coming of the one who is God-like. When he will come, he will do something with his mission so that our iniquity will be pardoned. So God is not just tolerating, turning a blind eye and says, oh, it's cool, it's cool, you're good enough, it's fine, it's fine, you know. That's not the message of God. And if you look at this expression, he passed over the rebellious side. I'm reminded of the Passover. What happened in the Passover? The Passover lamb. What happened? He was sacrificed. His blood was put on the, uh, on the door. Huh? So that when the angels of death came with his judgment, he did not kill anybody in that house because they were under the blood. But the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed so that my sin, my iniquity could be pardoned. Without the Passover lamb, who is Jesus? Why did he come? What's Christmas? This is, what, this, is, this is Christmas. This is Christmas here. So that the rebellious act of our lives can be pardoned through the sacrificial lamb and the angel of death pass, the judgment pass over us and not destroy us because God delights and is unchanging love. God is the same in the Old Testament. I said it and I will repeat it again. We have the impression that the God of the Old Testament is an angry God, a bloody God, a God of hitting, an angry God. He is not angry. He does not keep his anger. The, new, the Old Testament keeps repeating it from Deuteronomy, from the, the, the Psalms, from the, the, the prophets. It is repeated over and over that God does not retain his anger. Are we going to understand that and accept that as the truth? God is not an angry God. God delights in unchanging love and his unchanging love. That's what he wants for you. That's what he wants for me. This has never changed. He wants you and I to be happy, but in the, not in the false sense of it. Not a cheap happiness. Not a false religious happiness but the happiness that is based on the changed lives, on a pure relationship, that when I enter at Christmas and I say, I am coming to worship Emmanuel, my heart can worship God, and my worship delights the Lord. My, work, my worship, he likes it, he accepts it, because if not, he does not like it. My worship is not worship without my heart being changed by the sacrificial lamb. 
That's the message. This is a prophetic text. This is not about cheap grace and cheap, cheap salvation. You know, in, uh, in um, Titus chapter 2, it says the same thing about this text here. The grace has appeared. And it teaches us to say no to ungodliness or to anything that is godless, not godlike. The grace of God has appeared. What, what is he referring? He's uh, referring about the Messiah that has come. The grace of God with his forgiveness. That he will take our, our sins and it will flood it and lose it in the bottomless ocean. And the abyss of the oceans never to be seen or heard again. But someone has done that. The blood of the Lamb has been doing that. So the grace has appeared. Jesus has come. This has been fulfilled. And the coming of Jesus Christ. And this coming is teaching us that since he is so loving, since he is willing and looking forward to forgive all my unrighteousness, then I can really be changed. I can really receive the grace of God and says no to any form of anything that is ungodly. What is not godlike in my life must disappear. That is the message of the Bible. The problem from Genesis chapter 3, what is not godlike has entered into the world, has become the problem of all men, and from that time on, the message of God has become, I have a plan to change you, to bring you back. The prophets have just repeated over and over this message. The New Testament is proclaiming it again. And in fact, we are called to announce that message. After the resurrection of Jesus in Luke chapter 24 says that uh, the message of repentance will be preached to all nations. The message of repentance and salvation will be preached in his name. That is the message of Christmas. If we come, slide Ma Ma Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Then the prophet suddenly sees where this ruler is coming from. He sees another. This is one of the greatest prophetic passages of the Old Testament. As for you, Bethlehem of Ephrata, even though you remain least among the clans of Judah, nevertheless, the one who will rule or who rules in Israel for me, for God, will emerge from you. His existence has been from antiquity, even from eternity. His going forth, his family descent has been from uh, eternity. Remember the wise men, the story of the wise men? What were they searching for? They were searching for he that is born the king of the Jews. And the chief priest, did they know where the Messiah was supposed to come from? Did the chief priest, the master of the law, did they know where the Messiah, did they answer that question? Where is the one who is born to be the king of the Jews? Did they find an answer to that? Yes, they found an answer. The chief priest says, it is written, he's coming from Bethlehem. And they went to look for him in Bethlehem and they found him in the manger. Is that the Christmas story? How did they know he's coming from Bethlehem? Because Micah, 700 years earlier, had told the exact location where this Messiah was going to come from. This ruler that would come. And then, if you look at the text of the New Testament, there's a slight interpretation difference in how they explain it. Because in the first one, it says, it remains the least. Bethlehem is nothing, okay, as, as a city. But they say, Bethlehem, you are by no means least among the rulers. It's the opposite. You are a great city because from you has come the ruler who will shepherd my people. And there is a difference between, you remember the rulers in Micah? The rulers oppress, they use bribe, they work only for money and all this. And this ruler who is going to come, the one that we celebrate at Christmas, the one who is godlike, he is going to lead as a shepherd. He's going to protect. 
It's going to feed. It's going to do you good. It's going to lead you to the peaceful waters and the green pastures. It's going to take care of your soul. It's going to restore your soul. It's going to do you good. So that's the difference between the rulers in the time of Micah and this ruler who is coming and that we celebrate at Christmas. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Are you, which, which rulers would you prefer to have? The, the one in Micah or the one that is, has come? I know the answer, so I should not ask you a question like that. It's easy. Yeah. And then the prophet sees another wonderful vision, and we're closing with that, across the centuries. He sees past Babylon, the, the conquest of the Babylonian Empire. He sees past the, all the empires of the past. He sees beyond that the future. He sees past the Reformation, Martin Luther, Calvin, uh, John Wesley. He sees beyond that. He sees beyond our generation. He looks ahead to the future time, what we call the millennium, what we call the, the rule of that great ruler, when there will be no war, they will not build weapons, they will not sell weapons, and he will be uh, ruling. Uh, Micah chapter 4 verse 1. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. All people will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways so that we may walk in his paths that we may be following the ways of the Lord. Be like God. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And we announce that when this leader will come in this world and do his missions, we, the pro proclamations and, and the advance of the gospel will start from Zion and will reach to the end of the world. And this is, we are part of that. There's a part of that fulfillment that is to us, to all generation who are following the Messiah, and up to the time when he will rule on, on earth and the millennium uh, seasons. And he says that the law here, I just want to draw your attention here, the law will go out from Zion. He says, no, this is the good news. The law is the Old Testament. We're not preaching the law. But let me tell you something, that in the good news, in the good news, you know there is also the bad news. The good news makes sense only when you understand the bad news. The bad news is that we have sinned and we have fell short of the glory of God. We are lost. We deserve judgment. The good news is that Jesus took it from us and if we believe we are saved. But it is necessary in order to receive the good news that we understand the bad news. So the law here is a tool of instructions used so that it, it teaches us our message is based on the law because it's, it sets God's standards of righteousness and holiness, right and wrong. It is through the law that we become aware of sins. When the law says do not steal and you steal, then you know you've done something wrong. So the law is at the foundation of the morality, the, the standards of God, and it is necessary that the law is part of the gospel. Not that we are under the law, but that the law help us to understand sin, disobedience, God's standards, holiness and righteousness. And then we understand that, then we can recognize our sinfulness. So the law is necessary. The law will go out from Zion. So this knowledge of right and wrong we will, we is, is part of our, of our message of the gospel when, when we preach. So that is what it means. But our message offers forgiveness and acceptance. It is a message of hope and abundant life. So the tragedy in this book is that the people were deceiving themselves and thinking they were okay based on their artificial spirituality. But they were misguided. So we have also this this possibility in our generation to, to base our sense of security on the wrong place. And so we have to put the first thing first. Micah chapter 6 verse 8, Know, O people, 
The Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Nothing more, nothing less. It's a true life, a change. Put away all the non-God in your life. Confess before God so that your sins may be sent into the depth of the sea. What is walking humbly with God? Walking humbly with God is walking in the light. There's no hiding from God. Recognize, just, just live in the truth. And who is God like? Do you want to be like God? If you want to be like God, you have to be like the one, Jesus Christ, God himself. He will make you to be like, like him. And then pray this morning. Please close your eyes as we finish. God, this morning, forgive us and convict us of our falsehood, our false sense of security based on religious and good deeds that we carry with us and that we 